in this space to worship together. For those of you who are making your way in, I would ask you to come in and take your seats and uh, would love to have your attention for just one moment as we're kind of going through a, a, a few announcements um, to get us started this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, we're going to be hearing from our graduate chaplain this morning from our Mission Valley campus, Gordon Wong, uh, will be speaking to us. And then in tonight's chapel, in Time Out, we'll be hearing from McKenna Herrero. And she is a member of our women's soccer team, and we're so excited to hear from her and hear the ways in which God is working in her life in these recent days. And so I'm going to ask you all to pause your conversations this morning. We have a, a great announcement from our alumni relations office. So I'm just going to have uh, Kendall make her way forward as uh, she tells us some, some of the great things that are happening and some opportunities that we can get involved. Thank you. Good morning, Point Loma. My name is Kendall Lucas, and I am the Director of Alumni Relations here. And I have the exciting opportunity to announce to you all that today is Point Loma's annual day of giving, Green for Gold. We're very excited. So uh, we are working tirelessly right now. We're over uh, at the cafeteria this morning. But we are trying to raise $250,000 in 24 hours for student scholarships for you guys. Um, so that is our goal this year. It is a lofty goal. It's more than we've ever raised. This is our fifth annual day of giving. And the exciting thing about today is that yes, we do want to raise $250,000, but what we really want to do is get people involved. So every $1 gift, every $5 gift is what we're looking for. We've actually challenged two of your uh, 2019 alums, Tess Murray and Connor Brandenburg, who are the 2019 class reps. We have given them $5,000 and we've said, if you can get 20 of your 2019 classmates to give, we're gonna release $5,000 to the cause today. So cheer on your 2019 grads. Uh, we're excited to be doing this. Um, we have a website, greenforgold.pointloma.edu, where you can follow along. There's also gonna be a banner outside of the CAF today that we're gonna be up to getting manually. Uh, you are the first to know that this morning we've already crossed the $30,000 mark. So we're really excited about the start this morning. The last thing before I throw it to the video that your ASB president, Jackson Wise, has uh, put together for you is that we will be outside of the CAF today. We want you to participate by coming and writing a reason why you love Point Loma. That's the only thing we ask you to do today. We've got green and gold donuts we're giving away. Come write your love for Point Loma. And uh, here's a video from Jackson. He's gonna tell you a little bit about the, more, about the day. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm Jackson Wise, ASB president. And today we're celebrating Green for Gold, PLNU's fifth annual giving day, a day where our entire community comes together to raise as much as we can for the students and for the university. For 24 hours, parents, faculty, staff, students, and other generous supporters will rally together to raise $250,000 towards the university fund for student scholarships, our highest goal to date. Point Loma has been so good to me, and I know it's been so good to many of you as well. Ever since a freshman, I felt loved for and cared here, and I can't imagine a better place to come to college. But it wouldn't have been possible without the help of scholarships and generous donors. That's why this year, along with the rest of the ASB board, I'm so excited to give back through Green for Gold. To make your impact, visit pointloma.edu slash greenforgold. Every gift makes a huge difference. Seriously, even a dollar means a lot. I thank you for your generosity and for coming together to support students like me and the university. This morning, as we uh, get ready to engage into a time of worship, I, I do want to start off with, with, with something. And um, one, I, I want to thank you all for your, your hospitality, um, particularly in the ways in which you have been welcoming our speakers. Last Friday, we had Christine So with us, and it was uh, amazing to see the ways in which you were engaging uh, with her, even in the ways in which she was asking you to participate and, and all of that. And so I really appreciate this. But I also want to draw you uh, draw attention to something else as well. And so I, I want us to also be mindful in the ways in which we're hospitable uh, is also uh, being uh, present here and being present all the way until the end. And so one of the things that we'll ask you to do is um, when a speaker is here, and we're, we're 
entering into a rhythm of having a lot of our ex external speakers coming in um, this semester. And so my ask um, is that in our hospitality and our engagement, that we stay until, uh, until we are dismissed, um, th that we honor the, the preparation that they have given and the ways in which they are pouring out into the life of our community. And so uh, I I'm grateful for the ways in which Point Loma over the years, and particularly in the semester, we have been people who have been hospitable. And so let's continue um, in that way of hospitality. And so um, I'm gonna ask Annika, Annika, if she can make her way uh, forward. And uh, we're gonna have a time of, of prayer this morning. So let's go ahead and quiet our hearts and let's pause for a moment as we prepare uh, to enter into a time of worship, uh, worship together. You can bow your heads with me. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us this time to focus on you and to rest in who you are and who you say we are. I pray that the distractions and stresses of the day would fall silent and we can feel your peace, a peace so whole that we can't even understand it. I pray that you would open our hearts and minds this morning to hear your voice over our lives. You are so worthy of our worship, God. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In the year that, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorsteps and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. The word of the Lord. to pray for workers in the harvest field. And I forgot to turn that off, so I apologize. <laughs> Aloha, everybody. So great to be back with you again. I have a question for you. H have you ever been in the presence of greatness? Like, just experiencing something amazing and so great that when you experience it, your heart just races and you feel euphoric and it's just like an out-of-body experience. Have you ever had an experience like that? I'm sure many of you have. I was uh, sp talking to my, my daughter about a month ago. She got to go to uh, see John Mayer in concert. And uh, yeah, right? And so uh, I, I uh, saw her after the concert. I said, hey, Annika, how was the concert? And she was like just glowing as she began to tell me about the concert and how great it was and how amazing. She was like, wow, Dad, it was an amazing concert. Probably the best concert I have ever seen in my entire life. And then she used these words which kind of uh, caught my attention. She said, Dad, the whole thing was life-changing. <laughs> I was like, really? Wow. Now, I'm not like a, a big John Mayer fan because I'm old and I don't know his music. <laughs> but I get it. You know why? Because I, three years ago, got to see the band U2 in concert. That's right. <laughs> my daughter, Brianne, my older daughter, who was a student here, we were back in Hawaii over the summer, and she said, Dad, do you know what I want for my 20th birthday? I said, what do you want? She said, I want to go see you two in concert. They're coming to San Diego. Will you go with me? I said, give me a second to think about it. 
Yes. <laughs> and so we went online and we got tickets and I booked my flight to fly out here and I flew all the way from Hawaii to see the band, my, one of my favorite bands, U2 in concert for their 30th anniversary of the Joshua Tour uh, album. It was amazing. We got to uh, Qualcomm Stadium and we were sitting uh, in pretty decent seats and uh, as the lights started to dim, because the band was about to come out, I just started to get excited. My heart was racing. And then through the darkness, I could see the band members start walking out. And Larry Mullen Jr., the drummer, sits down into his drums and he starts beating the iconic beginning to one of U2's most iconic songs, Sunday Bloody Sunday. The crowd is going crazy. And then through the darkness, another band member appears with a guitar strapped around his body. And he starts, it's the edge. And he starts playing the opening riff to Sunday Bloody Sunday. That's right. <laughs> I'm not going to sing for two reasons. First, I'm a terrible singer and I, I just embarrassed myself. And, uh, and, and the second reason is I'd ruin the song, right? What I did do was I took my phone, which went off a little earlier, <laughs> And I recorded the opening of the whole, the whole beginning of that concert. And the whole time the band was playing, I was singing along, and I was going to take that recording and post it on social media until I played it back and I started to watch. And then I listened, and I heard myself singing on the recording, and it was awful. It was just terrible. And I share this Terrible, terrible news with you about not being able to repost that. It's just a, a great memory I have now. I was too embarrassed to post it. I share this whole exciting episode with you because I want to share a point about greatness. Greatness casts a big shadow of humility on normal people like me. <laughs> you see, I, I'm, I'm not a, a very good singer, and, and I know it. And singing with Bono, even in that setting at, at the concert, clearly showed what an awful singer I am. And his greatness casts such a bright light on my lack of singing ability and, uh, and that, that I was just so embarrassed even when I listened to myself on the recording. And you know what I have learned? I have learned that when I stand in the light of greatness, my flaws are clearly shown, and it's rather humbling and sometimes humiliating. I've had other brushes with greatness before. Um, about 15 years ago, while I was a pastor in Hawaii, uh, I got to see Tiger Woods play golf live in person. Now, something about me that you may not know is I'm, a, I'm kind of a golf geek. I'm one of those rare people that loves to watch golf on TV, right? Who does that? Ugh. But I do because it's so exciting to me, right? And uh, to, to see people be able to, to, to do something that's so difficult and challenging, that's part of the reason why I enjoy golf so much. I love the camaraderie. I love how difficult it is because when you do good and you get a birdie, man, it's euphoric, right? And I love to watch these guys hit the ball 300 yards and chip and putt like crazy. And 15 years ago, Tiger Woods was at the top of his game. He was winning all kinds of tournaments, making critical putts just when it mattered. And he came to Hawaii, and I got to see Tiger Woods in person playing golf along with this large gallery. And every so often, I got close enough on the tee box when he was teeing off. I, I was only five feet away from Tiger Woods. It was so amazing. 
And given the opportunity, if this ever were to happen, if someone would say to me, hey, Gordon, would you like to play a round of golf with Tiger Woods? You would think I would jump at the chance to play golf with the greatest golfer in the world. But when you stop to think about, when I stopped to think about it, I said, mm, do I really want to do that? My, it's exhilarating to watch him play golf on TV and, and even more exhilarating to see him in person. But to play golf with Tiger Woods, I mean, we both play golf, but honestly, we, we, we play a, a different game. I'm not a bad amateur player. I mean, I, I can hit the ball. But Tiger Woods is the greatest ever. And if I were to play golf with him, the bright light of how great he is at golf would shine on me, and every flaw in my game would just be magnified. It would be exhilarating to play with him, but for him, it'd be no fun to play golf with a guy like me. It's true. And so I, I, I thought about this and I uh, just thought, wow, you know, what a great experience that would be, but what a humbling and maybe even an embarrassing thing it would be to play golf with Tiger Woods. Because when I'm around people that are really, really great at what they do, it's amazing to watch. Wow, there's Bono. Wow, Tiger Woods is just five feet away from me. But if I try to do what they do, all of my flaws are clearly seen. I'd never want to sing for Bono or play golf with Tiger Woods. It's exhilarating to watch. It might even be life-changing. But one of the things that I think you understand where I'm going is that when you see greatness like that, it really exposes us and exposes our flaws. That is what's happening here in Isaiah chapter 6 that Sharia read for us. And I'm sorry about my alarm going off. I know that just was terrible. <laughs> But here in Isaiah chapter 6, the greatness of God is on full display. In fact, God's greatness is really next level greatness. You know why? Because they're in this scene here in Isaiah 6. The angels and the seraphims are there. And we would think these angels and seraphims, these angelic beings, we would think they're great. If they ever appeared here, we're, they'd be shining. We'd be like, wow, look at that. That's amazing, right? They're in awe of God. These great angelic beings, they're the ones that are in awe of God. And their only response to being in God's greatness is to say these words, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they are worshiping God. And God is deserving of every breath of it. God's greatness is next level. He's worthy of it all. And it is into this very scene that Isaiah enters into the picture. Isaiah, not an angel, a mortal Someone like you and me. And Isaiah walks into this scene where angelic beings are giving God honor and glory and praise because he is that great. And God's bright light of holiness shines on Isaiah. And immediately, Isaiah is exposed. He's exposed for who he is because God's great light of holiness humbles Isaiah to the point of knowing, check this out, that his life literally hangs in the balance. You know when you see something really, really great, your, your, your most common or frequent expression is like, wow. You know when I saw Tiger Woods, I was like, wow. There's Bono. I'm at a U2 concert. Wow. Isaiah doesn't say wow. Do you remember what he said? He says, whoa. Whoa, whoa am I. I'm ruined is what he says. <laughs> I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a 
people with unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He thinks it's over for him. Instead of being a life-changing experience, he thinks that this is a life-ending experience because he is, he is undone by the greatness of God. And when you think about it, Isaiah's a good man. He's a prophet of God. But as good as he is, when God's great bright light of holiness shines on Isaiah... Isaiah is undone. He says, I'm, I'm ruined. And it's interesting to notice God's response to Isaiah in this scene. How does God respond to Isaiah? Because Isaiah clearly doesn't belong there in his holiness, right? But Isaiah makes this unbelievable confession that I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a, a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king. So what does God do? Does he destroy him? Which clearly is what Isaiah thinks he's going to do. Does God punish him? Does God humiliate Isaiah? No, none of those things. Amazingly, God redeems him. He sends an angel to purify Isaiah by touching a, a live coal on his lips. And that purifies Isaiah, that cleanses Isaiah. And what that does is it allows God's holiness not to overwhelm Isaiah. God reaches out to Isaiah and initiates this beautiful redemption. And that's remarkable. And then he does something even more beautiful. God invites Isaiah to join him in what God is doing. Who will I send? Who will go and speak for me? And Isaiah's like, I'm the only guy here, so uh, here am I, Lord. Send me. And that was the plan all along from God, to send Isaiah and to use Isaiah because of Isaiah's honest confession of who he is. Wow. I think that's beautiful. And it's so interesting to see other encounters that people have with this amazing great God of ours in the Bible. And to see what they, what they, what they do and what they say when they have come face to face with God. Another amazing example of something very similar like this happens in the New Testament. When Jesus appears to Simon Peter and shows his greatness in Luke chapter 5, Simon Peter and his crew had fished all night long and caught nothing is what the Bible says. I've been fishing a lot and caught nothing. It's terrible. <laughs> and he did that for a living. Fished all night and caught nothing. So in the morning, they're done fishing. They're exhausted. The Bible says they're washing their nets, getting ready to call it a day. And Jesus rolls up on the shore with this great crowd of people following him. And probably because there were so many people, Jesus gets on Simon Peter's boat and says, Simon, will you pull out just a little bit? So he comes into the water just a little bit. And then Jesus can greet the whole crowd and assembly that's there. And Jesus begins to teach them. And Simon Peter, sitting in the boat, has a front row seat to hear Jesus teach. And when Jesus is done teaching, Jesus says to Simon Peter, let's pull out a little bit deeper and let's go fishing. And, and Simon Peter goes, oh, Lord, I've gone all night and caught nothing. But because you say so, we'll do it, fully knowing that he's not going to catch any fish. They pull out into deep water. He lowers the nets, and something great happens. They catch so much fish that the Bible says Simon Peter's nets start to rip. So Simon calls over to his friends, hey, come over and help me. And they sail out there, and the two boats are filling up all the fish, and this is how great the catch was. They say there was so much fish that the boats started to sink. That's amazing. That's great. Wow. And do you know what Simon Peter's 
response was to that greatness. Is this passage of scripture up here? He says this, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees. And he says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And when Jesus said to Simon, Do not, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats up on shore. And then they left everything. They left everything and followed Jesus. What this story tells me is that God's greatness illuminates everything about us. And when God's light of holiness shines into our lives, we are undone. And our honest confession of who we are is vital to the ongoing relationship that we have with God. Isaiah made that confession. I am a, un, I'm a man of unclean lips. Simon Peter makes that confession. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Do you think they're telling God anything that God doesn't already know? Of course not. But it's for them to know. Even the Apostle Paul, when he writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. The Apostle Paul says that. The guy who wrote half the New Testament makes this amazing confession that he himself is a sinner. And here's the thing, <laughs> God already knows it, right? And when we humble ourselves and honestly confess who we are, you know what I find amazing is? God's response to us, right? He redeems us, he purifies us, and then God, I love this, he invites us to join him. He invites Isaiah Go for me and speak for me. He invites Simon Peter. I will make you a fisher of people. But you know what? Honestly, and you know this and I know this, there is also another response that we have when God's great light shines upon us. The other response we have, instead of coming into the light and making an honest confession is to run and to hide. I've done that, and you may have too. And so does Adam and Eve when they have fallen short, when they have disobeyed God, and when they have sinned. They knew it. And when God came to the garden to find them, where were they? They were running and hiding. And here's what I have found about what happens when we run and hide from God instead of coming to the light and make an honest confession. You know what happens when we run and hide? Nothing. Nothing good anyway. There's, there's no, no good that can come from our running and hiding from God. It makes no sense to do that. And I understand why Adam and Eve hid, right? It's the same reason Isaiah thought he was going to be ruined. We think that God's going to punish us when we step out into the light and our sins are made known. But over and over and over again, you know what I find? I find a loving and redemptive God that reaches out to us and draws us closer when we are honest with ourselves and honest with him. What if, what if Adam and Eve made that confession, I think this world would be a different place. And what if, what if you and I, instead of hiding in the shadows, because we know we're sinners, what if we step out into the light and allow God's bright light of holiness to shine upon us and we make 
the confession of who we are that God already knows. I think, I know that God's great love will be there to redeem us and invite us to join him in the great work that he is doing. Last week, Esteban's message talked about King David, who was a man after God's own heart. But like all of us, he sinned. And instead of confessing his sin, he tried to hide it from God. Brought Uriah back to try to sleep with his wife. And when that didn't work, sent Uriah to the front lines and had him killed. You guys know the story. And his heart's aim departs from God. And that led King David down a road of self-exaltation, the kind of same self-exaltation that Adam and Eve tried to find when they took the fruit and ate it. Today, I want you to know that holiness shines to illuminate our lives. And when it does, it'll expose us for who we truly are. And if we make an honest confession, we will find a redeeming God. But I want you to know that that light of holiness not only exposes us, it reveals God's nature. And it reveals the direction of where we can be redeemed and reunited with a loving God that cares so much for us, that is longing to restore relationship with us and invite us to partner with him so he can use us to be his mouthpiece for others. He can use us to be fishers of people so that that message of holiness not only touches our lives, but reaches out and touches the lives of those we know and those we love. Today is Wednesday, and Wednesday at the end of chapel, the altars are open. And today I wonder if there would be anybody today that would step out into the light and allow God's holiness to shine bright in us and make a good and honest confession of who we truly are to allow God to redeem us and invite us to join him in changing this world. Would you consider and open your heart to allow God to do that? And if you would be, if you would like to, the altars are open today. And if there are those that decide to come with the others, keep your conversation, maybe to yourself or wait till you're outside so that those who come can seek the, the voice of God today. Would you stand with me as I close this time in prayer? <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for this word that is so powerful to us. Thank you, Lord God, that you are a God of redemption and a God of calling and a God who never gives up. Don't give up on us. As you shine your bright light, would we respond positively and honestly to you? In your name we pray, amen. Go with God, you are dismissed. If you'd like to come and pray, we'll meet you here and join you in prayer.